Hi everybody, welcome to another IZ8 DWF repair video. This time an amateur radio friend asked me to service this little handheld transceiver. This is an Icom ECE90, it's a multiband FM transceiver. I've also got its battery charger. The whip antenna can be unscrewed and removed. This one can receive on a quite large range of frequencies, but it will transmit only on the 144 MHz, 430 MHz and 50 MHz amateur radio bands. Its owner said it stopped transmitting on the 144 MHz band, but it seems to be still transmitting fine on the other two bands. Anyway, according to the display, it seems to be transmitting. Of course, it refuses to transmit on the wrong frequencies. I'm going now to check the power output on the three bands. I have connected a coaxial cable to the antenna connector. And it goes to the input of a coaxial RF power meter. To the other side of the power meter I connected a stack of two power attenuators for a total of 40 decibels and a small 50 ohm termination. Instead of using a power measurement slug on the wattmeter, I'll use this wideband sampling slug that will give me a 50 dB attenuated sample of the RF signal passing through the wattmeter. And the output of the slug will be connected to a spectrum analyzer. First, I'll try transmitting on the 50 MHz band. The spectrum analyzer is set for a very large band sweep. Mm, wrong button. Here we go, we can clearly see the carrier. Let's switch to the 2 meters band now. 145025, it's okay. And indeed, no carrier appears on screen. Let's try now the 70 centimeters band. Here it is, and here again we get a nice carrier. So yes, the fault is confirmed. Now, luckily, the service manual for this transceiver is available for download. You can find a link to it in this video description. The only way to work on a very small handheld like this is to take it apart completely. The instructions are given in the service manual and I need to remove the RF unit which is the innermost one. I never look forward to service the handheld transceivers anyway. So I started by removing the bottom cover. I took pictures of every single step to make sure I don't forget anything when it's time to assemble it back together. Here I have removed the adhesive shield and we can also notice a little metallic tab under the bottom left screw. After disconnecting the flat cable we must remove a series of solder joints on the top part. I use a copper wick wetted with extra flux. Since the joints connect to the external metallic shield and I cannot use a too big tip, the soldering iron needs to be set at least at 350 degrees Celsius. Quite some length of copper have been used, but finally this board can be unscrewed and removed. At this point one side of the RF board is exposed. 
Now I need to decide whether or not removing also the RF unit from the case. So I started studying the circuit description on the service manual. My approach will be to understand what part of the transmit circuit is unique to the 144 MHz band and see if I can test it from the top side of the board only. In this transceiver, the transmit amplifiers are shared by all the three bands. Different filters are switched before the drive amplifier and after the power amplifier. However, the first filter is shared with the 430 MHz band that is still working. So, I'll first check the components indicated in the 144 MHz TX filter circuit. Now, most of the parts indicated in the 144TX filter are on the top side of the RF unit, which is good. However, some of them are under this metallic shield, and that can be only removed when the PCB is extracted from the transceiver's case. So, with more copper wick and patience, I decided to also remove this last PCB. Luckily, this was not the most difficult one. We can see some thermal paste that helps dissipating the power amplifier's heat to the metallic case. And here is the other side of this little PCB. It's not going to be easy to test those very small SMD parts in circuit. Anyway, I decided to start testing the exposed components before removing the metallic shield, since this doesn't look an easy job after all. I started looking with magnifying glasses at the components listed in the 144 MHz TX filter description, looking that no solder joints were visibly broken, then checking for any shorted capacitor and any suspect diode with the multimeter. And then it happened a very lucky find on D19. When probing this one with the multimeter, it showed like open circuit in both directions. This is really as lucky as it can get on such a repair. So I removed the D19 and verified that it indeed was faulty. This picture shows its now empty pads inside the red circle. I'm not very good with SMD work, but on a board like this I can still do the basic jobs. Now it's time to find a suitable replacement. The part list on the service manual tells us that the original part number is 1SV271. The 1SV271 is a pin diode. It's a special type of diodes made usually for variable radio frequency attenuators or switches. Basically, their forward biased dynamic resistance can be varied by varying the forward current, and when they are not polarized or have a reverse polarization voltage, they exhibit a very small capacitance. Of course, this particular diode is out of production, and unless we want to try our luck on eBay or AliExpress, it cannot be bought from a reputable electronic store site. So, let's understand what are the important characteristics we must look for on a replacement part. First of all, of course, we must look for pin-type diodes. Then, since we know it's used as an on-off switch to allow the RF signal to pass on the right transmit filter, all that matters is a capacitance as low as possible when reverse polarized. This one shows a maximum of 0.4 picofarads at 50 volts reverse bias, so we aim for an equal or lower value. Second, we need a forward resistance as low as possible. Here we have a maximum value of 4.5 ohms at 10 mA of forward current, so again we aim for an equal or lower value at the same current. And last but not least, we of course need it to have the same case dimensions. The original dimensions correspond to the SOD323 package, by the way. A quick search showed a few different suitable replacements, like for example the BAR63 or the even better BAR64 from Infineon. So let's see how the BAR63 compares to the original diode. 
First, we want to check the capacitance value. This one has a maximum value of 0.3 picofarads already at 5 volt reverse bias. This is much better than the original that was specified at 50 volts. Also, the forward resistance is less than half respect to the original diode. This datasheet does not indicate a maximum value at 10 million pairs, but we exceed the original diode already with a maximum value at 5 million pairs, and the forward resistance can only decrease as the forward current increases. And of course, I searched for pin diodes that have an SOD323 package. For this one, we need to order the bar 63-03W part number. After a few days, I received these ones. It's always good to have a few spares. For example, because I lost the first diode when I peeled off the plastic film to extract it. Then it instantly flew off, never to be seen again. I have soldered a replacement diode and verified that it still tests correctly in circuit. At this point I could assemble the various PCB out of the case to test the transceiver, but to do that I need also to provide a heat sink for the final amplifier. Since that fire diode can produce the exact symptom we observed, I decided instead it's better to assemble back the transceiver and then check if everything works as expected. Since I've taken enough pictures when disassembling it, I didn't forget to replace this little metallic tab in the correct place. So let's try transmitting in the 2 meter span now. Yeah, we have the nice carrier back. So far, so good. Now, I want to check that the power output of the transceiver is up to the specifications. Here, we can read that the high power output is 5 watts typical, with the battery charged to 8 volts. On the low power setting, it should be half a watt in the same battery conditions. However, this old battery didn't charge to 8 volts even when I left it charging overnight. It reached more or less 7.5 volts. Now, to precisely measure the power, I use my HP432A power meter. Since it can only measure up to 10 mW, I'll use a 30 dB power attenuator between the power meter head and the transceiver antenna connector. With 5 W output, 30 dB will be enough to not overload the meter head. Let's now transmit on 145 MHz with high power setting. The meter's needle indicates minus 4, that's good. But let's see now how that minus 4 reading can be translated into the actual power output. The instrument is set to the 10 dBm position, so a reading of minus 4 means 4 dB less than 10, or in other words, 6 dBm. Then, since we have a 30 dB attenuator before the head, the total power output of the transceiver is 6 dBm plus 30 dB or 36 dBm. The HP432A reads power in dBm units, which is an absolute power indication. In fact, 0 dBm by definition is the reference level indicating a measured power of 1 mW. Now, any 10 dB increase is like multiplying the reference level by 10, so 30 dBm means 1 mW multiplied by 10 for 3 times, that gives 1 Watt. But we need an additional 6 dB to get to 36 dBm. Luckily, 6 dB is another easy number. In fact, a 6 dB difference means a factor of 4 to the power difference. So, to go from 30 to 36 dBm, we multiply 1 watt by 4 and we obtain 4 watts. And that's not too far away from the typical 5 watts of this transceiver, considering the battery is not able to produce the rated voltage anymore. Let's try now for 137 MHz. 
Well, now the needle moves to minus 4, then drops quickly to minus 5. It's a bit less than 4 watts then, but it's still okay considering the battery voltage issue. Let's try 50 MHz. Ah uh, yes, same here, it goes on minus 5, so less than 4 watts. Now I'll try the low power setting, which is too low for this scale, so let's switch down to 0 dBm scale. And here we get back a minus 5 indication, but on this scale it corresponds to a bit less than 0 0.4 watts, which is ok. 145 MHz is ok on low power. On 437 is a bit lower. Well, these little transceivers show these differences anyway. So, I hope you enjoyed this rather lucky repair and I hope you also learned something new. It's all for this video. If you have any question, please use the comment section below. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.